Hello everyone, my name is Aaron Standard and today we are going to be investigating a little .NET mystery that occurred in some of the work we were doing on Aka.NET over the past several months. So this is kind of our meta issue, which summarizes several other sub problems that we noticed. The long and the short of it is that this is a bug that occurred inside Aka Stream, specifically the select async stage here. Now, here is where things get a little interesting. Select async is a really powerful stage for being able to take functions that return tasks, a wait on them, and then deliver the output uh, in the original invocation order downstream. So it's doing some task continuation stuff behind the scenes. Here's what makes this really interesting. We were getting the following exception back inside a whole bunch of different applications that all use select async which is this little cancellation cause must not be null exception right here. So what's happening here is that when a stream stage throws an unhandled exception, that is going to usually cause the stream to terminate. It's gonna get canceled. Uh, that means it's an unplanned termination usually. So when that occurs, uh, normally there'll have to be a reason given in the form of an exception. What was the exception that caused the stream to cancel? We have an assertion inside this internal on downstream finish method that checks to make sure that this exception is not null. Now, Akadonit's a, you know, a fairly old code, code base at this point. Obviously, we maintain it pretty well, but we don't have nullability enabled inside all of Aka streams. It's a fairly big library yet. So that's one of the reasons why maybe this exception crept in somehow. So after we did a fair bit of work trying to go ahead and narrow down some of the other potential culprits, we eventually figured out that select async must be part of the problem here. Now here's where things get really creepy. If I scroll down to this other issue, we noticed that this problem was occurring inside users' applications. It was also occurring inside at least two of our plugins that are built with select async internally. Akadat Persistent SQL, which is our you know, basically brand new sort of replacement for all of the different relational database implementations of Aka Persistence, And then also Aka Streams Kafka also ran into a version of this issue as well. And basically what would be happening here is we would see this exception, exception occurred inside select async while processing blah, blah, blah. So we'd see this little error right here. But here's where things got really creepy. If we go and dig into the code where this select async occurred, Get a load of this right here. In fact, I'll, I'll zoom in. This is the code that was supposedly throwing the exception. And what do you notice here when you take a look at it? Well, it's that everything we're doing is guarded in a try catch block. And this try set exception cannot throw down here. So the exception could not have in theory come from inside this method, yet the select async stage was reporting an exception. Now, one other important detail here is that inside the logs that were coming from Aka.net, we were basically seeing an you know, exception incurred inside select async, but we weren't actually seeing any exception get logged at all when this was happening. And in fact, this cancellation exception where we had this argument null value would also occur inside of here. So somehow the select async stage had an exception escape a catch block and still managed to blow up the entire Aka stream stage. How on earth could that possibly happen? Well, that's what we're going to investigate today. So let's go ahead and dive into the details. So this is the select async stage right here. And the way it essentially works, if I go down to its constructor, let me go ahead and find that. We pass in a degree of parallelism. This specifies how many parallel tasks can be in flight at any given time. And then the user passes in a function, this map func right here. This is that code that had the try catch in it that we saw a little bit earlier. The basic idea behind select async is that when data gets pushed into this stage, each piece of data that gets sent in, that's the TN generic type, is going to basically get emitted as a task.out. We will usually await on that task to go ahead and complete inside this function, and we'll take whatever the output is, and we will push that downstream. So essentially, this is a, a mapping function that can take an await on a task. That's what's going on here. But one of the things that select async does that's kind of special and important is it preserves invocation order. If I send elements one, two, three as input, even if the tasks for each of those elements complete in arbitrary orders, which they almost certainly will, we're going to deliver the output to the next stage in the stream in that same original invocation order. This is really important for data consistency in some scenarios. 
Uh, we do have the select async unordered stage, which relaxes that requirement in order to help accelerate throughput. But for consistency, select async is the stage you want to use. And importantly, select async unordered never had this bug. It was only select async. And the source of this bug, we believe, we were eventually able to trace it down to this holder class right here. The purpose of this holder class, it retains the message, it contains the future result that's going to be delivered once this task completes, and also retains a callback function right here. What's going to end up happening is this callback function will get invoked when the task completes. We will set the element, and then we will go ahead and call this callback right here, which is going to touch this little piece of code, holder completed. This get async callback function, this is a Naka streams piece of functionality, and it relates to how actors process messages in Aka.net. All Aka.net streams stages ultimately are implemented with actors under the covers. This is gonna take an asynchronous function that gets called outside the actor and pickle that as a message and then deliver the result as a message the actor will eventually process or basically the actor will eventually invoke the result of the function that way. This is basically a tool for marshalling context back inside the actor. So anything that happens inside the actual function we're invoking here, this is now executing inside the actor's context. So it's meant to be a thread safe way of being able to access the actor's state later. So that's what's going on here. And if we take a look at the way we are invoking these tasks, let me go ahead and scroll up to, yeah, on push. When we get new data pushed into us, we're going to invoke the function and get a task back. We're gonna create a holder that corresponds to that task. And the buffer is going to take that holder and move it to the end of the line. It's going to be the oldest element in the queue now when that happens. If the task completes right away, we'll go ahead and set the element right here, and then we'll invoke holder completed. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and run that set element and invoke stuff. That's all going to happen here in holder.invoke, where we're going to run this as a continuation task. So what this sets up, if I go back to the invoke function, this is potentially a dirty write is what's happening here. Set element is going to happen, happens on continuation thread. I think it's continue with. This is going to happen inside actor context. So two completely different threads. One thread is going to deal with the assignment of the result property. The other is going to invoke basically this callback and pass the entire holder object back in. And if I go back to the callback function, let me scroll down to that. Should be down here, holder completed. Here is where our little Heisen bug error was occurring. Element.isSuccess was returning false. But when we tried to log the exception right here, you can see that we're passing it in. That exception is actually null, which is why we can see this line but we don't see any stack trace to go along with it. And this fail stage method ultimately is what produces that argument null exception later. We're trying to cancel the stream stage without an exception, which is illegal per the Aka stream specifications. So what is really going on here? Well, I've already alluded to the fact that we might have an unsafe read, but there's something even weirder happening. How do we end up in a state where that result object can have is success as false and not have any exception set. Let's take a look at how the result structure is defined. It's a struct with a bunch of read only fields, is success, value, and exception. And the only two constructors it can accept is one where there's a value, which sets is success to true, and one with an exception, which sets exception equal to false. Now, in a future version of this code, we enabled nullability and all that good stuff, and there was never any cases where we were explicitly passing a null exception into this constructor here. So how could this have possibly happened? Well, this is where we're going to turn to one of the greats in the .NET ecosystem, Eric Lippert, one of the C-sharp language designers. So this is from a nearly 15-year-old blog post. This was written back in 2011, and I'm going to zoom in just a little bit. This is from one of Eric's posts about atomicity, volatility, and immutability being different. And specifically, he's talking about read-only structs. Here is the big problem here, is that even a struct with read-only fields, when you go ahead and assign a struct, you're doing an assignment by value, not by reference. We're not just adjusting a pointer. And doing a pointer adjustment 
may or may not be an atomic operation, I'd say usually you should assume it's not. That's the safe assumption to make. But assigning a struct with multiple fields is 100% never atomic, is basically what Eric is specifying here. Yes, when you read from read-only fields on a struct and multiple threads without any locking, you can get inconsistent results due to race conditions. But the situation is actually worse than that. Read-only fields need not give you results that you think are inconsistent, even in one thread. Basically, read-only fields in a struct are the moral equivalent of the struct author writing a check without having the funds to back it. What he basically goes on to describe here is this process by which when you assign one struct's value to another, there's sort of an overriding process that may happen. And essentially the behavior of how that struct assignment is done, particularly across multiple threads, is basically a, a, a sort of a gradual process that may not happen atomically, as he points out here. So how did we end up with this failure case? Well, take a look at the default base constructor of a struct right here. Unlike classes, there is no constraint for a struct to have to necessarily be initialized via one of the constructors you specify. The default constructor can be initialized. And the default constructed values for this struct is going to be is success is false. False is the default value for a bool. Uh, this value is going to be null. And this exception is going to be null. Essentially, all these values are going to be initialized to their default, which in this case will be false. So what happens if we get a default struct value when we're doing the read on a separate thread right here? Well, element dot is success would be false and the exception would be null, which is exactly the situation that produces this race condition here. Essentially, it's the lack of atomic assignment around structs is the problem. So in order to fix this issue, what we ultimately need to do is clean up that callback function. Let me go ahead and find that again real quick. It's this right here, this holder.invoke call that gets invoked on this continuation, that is the problem. This dirty write that happens right here, and the fact that there might be a read happening on a separate thread concurrently is what's producing this error. So here's the even more hilarious part. One of the other contributors to Ocket Up Persistent SQL asked, how can an exception escape a try catch block? There was no exception. In fact, that code probably completed normally. What ended up happening was a race condition where there was a dirty read of a struct that was be in the middle of being assigned, and that assignment produced inconsistent results. We probably ended up reading a default initialized value for the struct, and that is what created all the error conditions where this could occur. Now, the fix for this is relatively simple. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. All right, so we're back with our select async code, and this is the version that is now in production with Akka.net today. We have simplified the holder class quite a bit. We could probably even get rid of this message object right here. We've enabled nullability. Everything is fine and good with the world. But the real fix comes down to our callback function. Rather than passing in just the holder and doing this little dirty assignment first, we're now passing in a tuple that takes the holder and its result. And what we're essentially going to do is we're going to take that tuple there's the holder and the result, and we're going to pass in both values down here and do the assignment inside the exact same thread. That way, when we do the assignment, that's going to go ahead and complete as a single-threaded operation this way, and there will be no more data consistency problems from that standpoint. So this is how we went and fixed the issue. Uh, if you like learning about this type of, let's say, .NET systems programming stuff, please don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy your day.